Welcome everyone to the third Tadpole webinar. I am Danny Alexander. I'm the coordinator of the Europond project, which is the project that's organising the Tadpole Challenge, specifically the people you see listed there, and in collaboration with ADNI. So we've got a slightly different format today. We're going to have several different people talk about different aspects of the challenge, really the key things for making a forecast, and these are the things that we've had the most questions about, so we thought we'd use the last webinar to go into some detail on these different aspects. We will talk for around about 25 minutes, and as usual, after that, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. There are several channels that you can submit questions on at any time during the presentation, and we will come back to them at the end. So you can use the live chat that's associated with this stream. You can use the Google group. You can tweet us at Europond, or you can email tadpole at cs.ucl.ac.uk. There are people monitoring each of those channels, and they will feed us questions whenever you submit them. So let me start with just some updates from the, the challenge so far and recent developments. So first of all, I'd, I'd point you to our two earlier webinars, particularly if you're, uh, recent, if you're coming to Tadpole uh, fairly recently. So the first webinar really gave an overview of the challenge itself, the structure, the task, and motivation for that challenge. So I won't repeat that material in detail today. I'll give you a very brief introduction. But if you want more information motivating the challenge and arguing for its organisation, then I would point you towards that first webinar. The second webinar was various updates on the challenge, but I guess the key thing there was the, the prize structure, which we'd pinned down by the time of the last webinar. And so we, we used that webinar to announce the prize structure. Again, I'll summarise that today, but you, I'll refer you back for the details to that webinar or also just to the Tadpole website. So other recent developments, um, as many of you will have seen, we've initiated this Google group for discussion about the challenge. We're trying to take that discussion off the Tadpole mailing list, which really just came to the organisers to make a more public forum for sharing ideas, asking questions and presenting solutions um, about the various aspects of the challenge. So we'd encourage you to use that rather than the, the mailing list. The leaderboard, which was something I mentioned in the previous webinar, is now live. There's still a, a few wrinkles to iron out, but it's basically there and working, so I'd encourage you to have a look at it. This gives you a mechanism to test your forecasts before final submission and to see how you're to get at least an idea of how you're performing compared to, to other participants. We'll hear more about that later in this presentation. And last but not least, I wanted to just mention this hackathon, which is occurring at the UK PyCon later uh, next month on the 29th of October. So, and it, so this will feature the, the Tadpole Challenge. The task of the hack will be to produce, to try and top the, the, the Tadpole leaderboard and to initiate some strong submissions to, to, the, to the main challenge. So PyCon, for those that don't know, is a Python programming conference. So lots of people who are experts in Python will get together to have a go at the, at the Tadpole Challenge. It actually runs from the 26th to the 30th of October in Cardiff. If you happen to be in the area or fancy being in the area at that time, I believe there are still tickets available. So do get involved. It should be an exciting event. So brief introduction to Tadpole. Tadpole is a challenge to predict the progression of individuals at risk of AD. So specifically, the task is to identify people that at an age that puts them at the risk of developing AD, the individuals that will actually develop AD symptoms over the short to medium term. So that's over the next one to five years. The challenge uses the ADNI dataset. ADNI is the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. So they've been collecting data from at-risk subjects for about the last 10 years. And the challenge focuses specifically on what ADNI refer to as rollover subjects. So these are people who have contributed data to the ADNI study previously and have now committed to provide new data in the next phase of the study. So that gives us an opportunity to provide a completely unseen test set for evaluation of forecasts. And what Tadpole does is to collect forecasts of measurements from these rollover subjects from participants 
by the deadline of the 15th of November. We'll then store those for a year or so as new data are collected and then we'll evaluate the forecasts against that future data once we have a sufficient body of test data to compare against. And the prizes will go to the forecasts that best match that future data. So here's the prize structure that we propose. I'd like to start just by thanking our sponsors, the Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Research UK and the Alzheimer's Association for collectively providing a £30,000 prize fund. We're going to divide that up as follows. So we'll have a £5,000 prize for each of the three key features that we ask participants to forecast. That's first the clinical status. So this is just a th three-way classification problem. You have to identify that each rollover subject will either be cognitively normal, mild cognitively impaired, or Alzheimer's disease at the, at the time of future acquisition. Then the second two features um, present more of a regression problem. So the first is to forecast the ventricle volume. The ventricles are a region of the brain, and you can measure their volume using structural magnetic resonance imaging. The third feature is the ADAS 13 score. This is a composite cognitive score combining various written and verbal cognitive tests. So £5,000 prizes for the best forecast for each of those three variables. Then we have an overall prize, also of £5,000, which combines all three of those variables. And the winner of this will be declared the Tadpole Champion. And we decide that basically by a sum of ranks of positions of, in forecasts of each of the three independent variables. And then we reserve the last two £5,000 prizes for different categories of entry, the first from university students and the second from high school students. And both of those will be judged on classification of, uh, of clinical status. And we somewhat reserve the right to reallocate those prizes. They depend on getting sufficient engagement from those two groups, but it looks like we should have that. So the topics for the webinar today... Um, we're going to talk about three things. Alex Young is going to go into some detail about the data sets. So just to remind you, we have data set, a, a training standard data sets provided by Tadpole, D1 for training, D2 and D3 for prediction, and she'll give you some more detailed information on those. Then Raz Marinescu will talk you through the process of both generating and submitting forecasts to the, to the challenge. And finally, Neil Oxterby, will give you some information about the new leaderboard feature on, on the website. So I shall pass over now to Alex to talk about the data sets. So hi, I'm Alex. I'm just going to talk through the Tadpole data sets. So um, there are three main data sets involved in Tadpole. The first is D1, so that's the training data set. And this contains information from individuals with at least two time points in ADNI. And this is the data that you're going to be training your models on. Uh, the second data set is D2. This is the prediction data set, which lists the individuals that you should provide uh, forecasts of future measurements for. And the final one is D3, which is an additional prediction data set containing a single time point and a limited set of variables, which is a scientific experiment that we've made just to see how different models perform with uh, less rich, uh, less of a rich history of information about individuals. Uh, so first, I'm just going to get Neil to talk you quickly through how you download the data from ADNI. So this is the Lonnie webpage to log in to access the, the Tadpole data sets and the ADNI data in general. So I'm just going to log in using my account. And then you'll find the ADNI data under projects. I've got a few extra projects here because I have access to a few others. And once you're on the project page, you'll know that because you'll see the ADNI logo. You can go to the download section and find study data. And on the left, there's a column of different categories where all the ADNI data that's been converted to spreadsheets is available. What you want is down here in test data, where you will find the Tadpole Challenge data. You can select that and go over to download, or you can just click on it and that data will download from ADNI and you will get something that looks uh, includes this spreadsheet that I'm highlighting here in this browser window, which looks like this in Excel, and I'll hand it back to Alex. 
Okay, so I'm just going to talk you through the D1 and T2 uh, spreadsheet, this spreadsheet. So here we've got uh, different sets of rows. Each row here is an individual at a particular time point. And then there's various columns which give information about these individuals at that time point. So I'm first going to talk through the general organization of the columns and just highlight some of the key columns in this spreadsheet. And then uh, I'm going to talk you, uh, talk you through D3 afterwards. So here it's worth mentioning that all of these columns are actually in the data dictionary, which is uh, available with the data set when you download it. And you can find additional information about what's in each column in the data dictionary. Uh, so the first set of columns I'm going to highlight is uh, firstly column A. So column A is the um, identification number for each individual. This is a unique identifier for the individuals to help you to match them across visits and to other spreadsheets that you might want to use. Um, the next key bit of information is column C. So here's the uh, visit code. This gives you the visit number of the individual. So BL is baseline and then the other codes are M which is the month followed by the month number. So for example M06 is month 6. Uh, other key columns are E and F which are just telling you whether the individual is included in D1, uh, the training data set, and D2, the prediction data set. And then if we go along we've got uh, so some additional columns that are the columns that you're actually trying to predict the information for. So key columns are column X. So in column X we've got the ADAS 13 score, the cognitive test score you're trying to predict. Uh, in column AV we've got the ventricle volume, the volume of a specific brain region that you're trying to predict. And this should be normalized by the intracranial volume which tells you the head size in column BB. And the final bit of information that you're trying to predict is column BC. So this tells you the diagnosis of each individual. So NL is cognitively normal, MCI is mild cognitive impairment, and then uh, dementia. So after this main set of columns, there is uh, additional sets of columns that are added to the end of the spreadsheet and these contain some extra information that you might want to use. Uh, so I'll just highlight the sort of general structure of these extra columns because there's lots of columns. Um, so if you go over to column CT, this is the start of the free surfer measures of brain volume for different brain regions and these give you uh, these go from column CT to AFA. And then the next section is starts in column AFB. And this contains FDG PET measures, which tell you the glucose metabolism in different brain regions. Uh, another set of columns start after this, which are from... ASD onwards, and these contain amyloid PET measures of amyloid plaque deposition in different brain regions. You'll see as you go along here that you can actually get to missing entries, these are missed by uh, minus four uh, with blank spaces, and also you can see having there because it's an unique number. So that's just uh, missing information in this particular spreadsheet. Uh, so the next set of columns in the spreadsheet is from, start, starts at BBJ, which contains uh, tau pet measures of neurofibrillary tangles in different brain regions. And then BKT onwards are uh, regional diffusion imaging measures uh, telling you about changes in uh, brain tissue microstructure. And then finally, we have columns uh, BPY onwards, which are telling you different CSF measurements uh, from different proteins in the spinal fluid. Okay, so that's the main the main column structure of uh, D1 and D2. I'm now just going to show you D3.
Okay, so this is the D3 spreadsheet. It's generally got a very similar structure to D1 and D2. And this just gives you the cross-sectional time points for prediction. So this is just for scientific value to see how well the predictions can be made given only a single snapshot of information from an individual rather than a, a rich longitudinal history of information from the individual. Uh, so we've got the same set of individuals here as in D2, but there's only a single time point per individual. And it's a subset of the columns in D1 and D2, so we've just used widely available measures for this spreadsheet. Um, so a key thing to note when you're using D3 is to make sure that when you're training, you don't use um, longitudinal information from individuals in D3 to train accidentally. Um, and this, yeah, this task is just for scientific value, so there's no real benefit to, to doing this because no prizes will be awarded for this task. should also just note that we're planning to update D3 to contain um, some more cross-sectional data points, so stay tuned for updates via the mailing list, website, and Google group on D3. Uh, so now I'm just going to hand over to Raz van Marinescu, who's going to talk through the submission process. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Razan Marinescu. Um, I'll quickly talk about the submission process for Tadpole. The first thing you have to do is to go to their website and go to the submit page. And here you see uh, some information about how to submit results um, and also some uh, more information uh, on the useful script that we created uh, to help you make a, make a forecast and evaluate such a forecast. You can have a look on these scripts, you can find them on the Tadpole uh, GitHub repository and they're under the folder evaluation. So, um, you know, to make a simple entry, uh, you can start by downloading the um, template from, uh, from this link here uh, and then you save it on the local computer and you open it. Um, so just one oh, second this, we this is it I'll copy, okay. I'll copy some submissions in okay so um so this is how the template would look like um it, on the left you see the uh, rid column uh, so that is um uh that is that represents a unique identifier for every subject uh so from uh, this is subject number two and for um uh, the next thing, uh, the next column is the forecast month, which, which uh, yeah, uh, so there's a total of 60 months that you have to provide forecasts for. And on the right, you can also see the year and the, the actual month number um, for every entry. Um, now, uh, the, the template will be empty on the right, so you won't see any numbers. Uh, this will be completely empty, but um, the, the next three columns, what they represent are the relative probabilities uh, for each um, uh, clinical status. So uh, the first column is a cognitive normal uh, probability, For the, the middle one is a mild cognitive impairment relative probability, and the one on the right is the Alzheimer's disease relative probability. Um, afterwards, you have uh, ADAS-13, which is a cognitive test, uh, and also the um, 50% confidence interval, uh, lower bound and upper bound. Um, and finally, you have the same um, thing but for ventricles, which are normalized by the intracranial volume. Um, and uh, also, you have to provide the 50% confidence intervals. And um, we also prepared a simple MATLAB script, um, which you can again find in the GitHub repository. Um, under evaluation, and uh, this is called tadpole underscore simple forecast example that I am. Um, so the script simply uh, reads in the tadpole data um, and extracts a few columns of important information. The data uh, is loaded from the tadpole d1d2.csv spreadsheet, um, and uh, it, uh, it makes some forecasts and outputs them into uh, this uh, file which is called tadpole underscore submission underscore uh, team name. So here you can replace your team name here with, with your preferred team name and you can append uh, an index at the end uh, saying the submission uh, number. 
Um, so this is uh, some code which uh, just loads uh, the data from, uh, from the D1, D2 spreadsheet. And then we have another block of code which can generate a very simple forecast for the clinical status, uh, ADAS, and the ventricles. Um, now this is the bit of, uh, of the script which you might need to change. Um, and here you can implement your algorithm or your mathematical model. Um, um, and finally, at the end of the script, um, you have some code which um, uh, writes the output uh, to, a, to an output file, uh, write all these forecasts. So, um, so you have all the all them columns of the templates, um, and you have a start date starting from uh, January 2018, so that's, that's when the forecasts start. Um, so you probably won't need to change this, uh, this code. Um, and uh, we, we uh, you can simply run this using MATLAB or from the command line. Um, uh, you can do this from the command line using make eval, uh, which, uh, which runs a series of commands that are written in a make file. So at the beginning, it, um, it runs this MATLAB script um, and creates a, a forecast uh, file. Um, afterwards, it evaluates this forecast file uh, with a dummy D4 dataset that we uh, created, um, and finally, it um, um, it, uh, it just uh, evaluates the uh, the forecast uh, against this dummy D4 dataset, and um, uh, yeah, and you can find all all these scripts again uh, in the Tadpole GitHub repository, uh, and you can play with them, you can modify them uh, as you wish. Um, but we recommend that you uh, do the evaluation uh, uh, against this dummy D4 just to make sure that the uh, your forecast file is in the right format. Once you have it, um, you simply go back to the uh, Tadpole website and upload it um, in the, using the first link here. And here you just say choose file and you find the, your, uh, your forecasts and, uh, and upload them to our website. Which is actually um, over here. Um, there we go. So that's yeah. okay. So and that's it. And then now we hit upload, and that will uh, send uh, your forecast to uh, to to us, and we'll evaluate them. And now I will uh, finally pass on to Nia Oxtoby, who will talk about the leaderboard system. Thank you, Raz. So the leaderboard is something that we created in response to some feedback from the community. It gives you an op opportunity to compare the performance of your forecasting approach, your algorithm, with other participants in the Tadpole Challenge, and also an op option, opportunity for you to give it, get an idea of how you might perform in the full challenge. The leaderboard, obviously, because it's using, because uh, it does assess your forecasts, it works on existing data. So here's a little screenshot of the current leaderboard, or an old shot of the, of the leaderboard. Uh, in the graphic on the slide, you can see here on the left at the bottom the current, uh, the full Tadpole submission, which has existing data in the left block on D1, D2, and D3, forecasting in future, to future data in D4. On the right is the leaderboard submission, which is all based on existing data. So it's within the existing ADNI data. Uh, should be a bit of fun, but it also has a practical element, and you can submit as many times as you like. Um, to keep testing how your algorithm is improving as you go. Um, it's a very similar format to the um, full submission and we actually have some helper script with a slightly different name and also in the GitHub repository and also broken into read, generate, forecasts and output. Um, and So you can edit this one as well, use it as a starting point for your own leaderboard submissions, which will end up on the leaderboard page of the Tadpole website down at the bottom. So we already have a few. Now, we don't update this live yet, but the intention is to do so. Um, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, I think I will hand back to Danny. Okay, thanks everyone. So, I hope that information is useful to participants. Obviously, if you have any more questions, then do feel free to get in touch and we will 
help you out as best we can. So I think it remains just for me to remind you of the timeline. So really the next milestone we now have is the submission deadline on the 15th of November. We do potentially have time for another webinar in the middle of October if the community feel that would be useful. Do tell us if there are things that you'd like to see us present about the challenge and we will do so, but unless we hear anything, we won't do that and we'll assume that you all have it perfectly under control. Um, but otherwise, we look forward to your submissions. Finally, just left for me to say, here's some new haiku from our poets just for you to inspire anew. I hope it works. <laughs> we really look forward to your entries. Uh, and if you do have any questions, we will stick around to answer them now. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so someone asked about the purpose of D2. You're right to observe that the set of IDs in D2 are also in D1, that's true. So D2 is a subset of D1. D1 is basically the entire history of the ADNI dataset, um, that at least that has uh, multiple um, time points. So it's designed for training. So D2 takes a subset of the subjects from there and allows uh, which are the ones that we want to get the predictions for. So obviously we can't limit people not to use data that is available, so we make no attempt to do so. The purpose of D2 really is just specifically to specify which subjects we want you to make forecasts for. Otherwise, um, you're, you're right that everything that's contained in there is in D1. What's the other question? Is there an R version of the MATLAB code for forecasting? Uh, there is not an R version of the MATLAB code just yet. We Actually, we've been working on converting uh, or translating that MATLAB code into Python. That was our first, uh, that was our next target. So we could do that. If there is sufficient demand for R, we could consider it. Or better, if anyone fancies doing a translation into R, I don't think any of us are actually R experts particularly. Um, if anyone has done that or fancies doing it, that would actually be really useful and we, we would uh, happily post it. For ventricles, you need prediction of normalised, not the actual, that's absolutely right. Yes, yeah, so they need to be uh, normalised by intracranial volume. And actually, if you want to see, there are actually, it's not, there are several ways of doing that, in fact. And if you look in the, I think in one of the, the scripts that we put online, it shows you the exact code that we use for doing that normalization process. It actually uses a, a regression technique rather than just a, a direct normalization. So I'd encourage you to look that up. But yes, to answer your question, it's normalized, not the actual. We also have some other questions here. Um, why the change from predicting ventricles to ventricles normalized by intracranial volume? Is there more information in the normalized number? Or does it make more sense than ventricles? Is it easier to predict? And the number of decimal places on the leaderboard should be adjusted. Well, that's two issues there, so. Yeah, okay, decimal points, fine. Um, uh, so as for the, the normalized version of the ventricles, I think the reason for that choice is simply that it's, it, it, this is a common thing to do with that variable, and it makes it a, a more stable marker than just using the, the absolute value. So that was the choice, anyone want to add anything to that? Is that the reason? No, that's yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. Uh, another question, how many other teams have signed up? I can answer that one. We have uh, of the order of something in tens getting towards hundreds. Um, no, getting towards a hundred. <laughs> um, but i just take this opportunity, actually, thanks for the question, and I'll remind you to sign up, register both on the website and to email the participation agreement signed and scanned to the Tadpole email address um, because without the participation agreement you can't submit, without registering on the website you can't submit, so you need to do both of those things. So um, and we're getting new registrations every week. Another question, any colour on the usefulness of different features? I think this is asking do we have any tips on which features might actually be helpful for building forecasting models? 
Uh, in particular, the hundreds of columns that we assume are resulting from imaging data. This is a question, yep. um, which is true of a lot of the columns, some of the ones that Alex described earlier. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's absolutely right. A lot of the columns are uh, from imaging data broken down into a large number of different regions, and many of those will not be informative. I think the ones to concentrate on, at least initially, are the earlier columns in that spreadsheet, the ones that are more towards the left, um, because those are ones that were in uh, an, an, an earlier spreadsheet called ADNI Merge, derived specifically from ADNI for information, you know, for containing information on this kind of challenge. So I would initially focus on those kinds of things, um, you know, a relatively small number of imaging markers towards the left, things like um, aggregate um, cognitive scores, personal information like age and gender as well is probably worth uh, taking into consideration before you start looking at the large number of columns that come from imaging. And there's a follow-up final question. This is These have all been from Team Algos for Good. Uh, are the cross-sectional free surfer, banner Alzheimer's Institute PET summaries and DTI ROI summary measures somewhat equivalent? And if so, do you have a feel for which set is most accurate or complete? The answer is they're actually measuring different things. Free surfer measures volumes of brain regions. The banner spreadsheet, the banner columns in the Tadpole dataset measure hypermetabolism through FDG PET. So they're measuring actually glucose metabolism in the brain rather than the brain volume. And the DTI stands for diffusion tensor imaging, which is analyzing uh, the microstructure integrity from each region of the brain. So they're actually measuring different things. Uh, as for which is most accurate or complete, that's, that question's somewhat mute now that the, we've described and explained that those three things aren't measuring the same. Let's see if there are any other questions. Yeah, so um, some more questions here. Can we explain further which data should be used to train for predicting D3? So in terms of training, I think you know you, you can use any data you like. The, the difference really between D2 and D3 is which data actually goes into the, into the prediction. So uh, let me try and break that down a bit more. So I consider training to be building, building a, a, a model then the difference in D2 and D3 is what actually you input into that uh, model as a starting point to get to obtain a forecast. So in D2, you can use several times, you know, you, you, the input to the, to the model is several, several time points and a very large number of, uh, of measurements, whereas in D3, you only get to input a single measurement from that subject and a smaller number of, of markers. But in terms of training the model itself, I think you know in both cases, the uh, any training data is is reasonable. What do we mean by custom data? Okay, so this can be custom training data or a custom prediction set. For custom, let me talk about custom training data first of all. So the the, the training data that is in our in the tadpole D one data set all comes through a, a standard ADNI processing pipeline. So in particular using, for example, FreeSurfer. So, they, so the ADNI standard data processing pipeline uses FreeSurfer to evaluate different regional volumes from MRI. There are loads of other bits of software out there that will do a similar job. And very likely some of those other softwares will do a better job than FreeSurfer of evaluating those volumes. So. Uh, uh, a custom training data set that you might imagine using would be to process the raw ADNI images, which you can download from their site using a different, um, a, a different image analysis software. So that's custom training data. And you can use anything you like, um, but it, it, it's just using something different to what we use to generate the, the Tadpole D1 data set. So you may also use custom prediction set the thing that can't change is the set of um, subject IDs. The set of rollover subjects that you need to make forecasts for has to remain the same. But what can change is, again, the, the, pro the, the processing pipeline that you use to generate the measurements 
for those individual rollover subjects. DTI ROI measurements are almost all missing. Yes, it's, that's very true. And, and it's not only the DTIs, actually. So there are several um, kinds of measurement which are very sparse because they've only been done on a small subset of the ADNI cohort. So whether they're useful or not, we don't know. We thought we would just include as much information as we possibly could and leave it up to participants to ignore ones which they thought were not informative or there was not sufficient data. Um, but it, it's certainly true that there are several columns for which there are data available only for a very small number of subjects. So we leave it to you whether you want to consider those or not. A uh, similar question, is there a reason for all this missing data or is it all missing at random? It, well, both of those things, I suppose. The, the, the only reason it's missing is that it doesn't exist. So ADNI don't acquire every single measurement on every single participant. You know, you can imagine why not, because some, you know, certain very sick patients will simply won't tolerate a very long MRI scan or long battery of cognitive tests. And so not every subject undergoes every single test. So that, that's why it's missing. It just simply doesn't exist. Um, so is it missing at random? Well, only insofar as we don't, you know, before a participant comes in for an examination, we don't know which tests they will actually complete. So it's random in that sense. And it, so it hasn't been deleted by us or by ADNI. It just it doesn't exist. You have everything that, that, uh, that we have um, access to. That's all the questions we have so far. We might wait for a minute to see if there's another one on the live chat. Great questions, guys. Thanks. If you want any follow-up on any of these questions, please use the, the Google group, as you can see in the final slide. The slides will be available on the website as before, and we will also archive this live stream. If there's nothing else, oh, here we go. We've got another question from the live chat. Some patient disease status are also missing. Should they be excluded? So I think, so it's true that there are some patient status missing, and that's typically because the, the data that, so the, the, the status is made by a, um, an expert neurologist. And if they're missing lots of the data that they usually use to make that classification, then they may just not make a classification at all. I think for almost, I'd almost go as far as to say for every single subject in there, although I'm not completely confident about that, certainly for the vast majority of subjects that are listed in the, in the data set, there will, be a, there will be a clinical status at at least one of their time points. So if you're looking at one single row and you find that there's a missing clinical status, if you check the subject ID for that row and look for other rows that have the same subject ID, you will almost certainly find that at some point in that subject's history, a clinical status will have been, um, will have been specified. Okay, I think we'll wrap up there. Any further questions, do feel free to get in touch and we'll answer through other channels. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks for participating and good luck with the challenge. See ya.